Hello and welcome to today's Plante Presents webinar. I'm Mary Williams and your host. If you do have any difficulty connecting, uh, please put a message in the chat box or try connecting again or phoning or email Katie Rogers, krogers at ASPB.org. Today's webinar is brought to you by Plante and ASPB, and I'd like to give a special thank you to ASPB members who are attending. If you would like to join ASPB, we have a special code, PRESENTS10, that will give you a 10% discount on membership. Our speakers have time allocated for questions. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. Our moderator, Jürgen klein Venn from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, will be reading out your questions today. Feel free to discuss this webinar on social media using hashtag PlantePresents. You can visit our webpage for more information and to watch recordings of previous talks in this series. You can find us on social media as at ASPB and at Plante underscore org. We'll have a, a recording of this video will be posted shortly after it's finished. Now I'm going to turn this over to Jürgen who will introduce the speakers. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, a warm wel welcome also from my side to everyone um, that is watching this right now live or will watch this as a recording. Uh, we are very happy to host uh, Nikola and Jerzy today, so I think it's going to be a very special event mechanistically getting into synthetic and uh, cell biology. And uh, we were originally planning to end this uh, first season of the Plante Presents um, seminar series uh, today, but as you know, we cancelled one seminar uh, following the shutdown STEM uh, movement to dedicate a day to assess and uh, possibly tackle racism in science. Um, this is an important movement and, and we hope that we will jointly create a community of equal opportunities. And the seminars um, of uh, Carolyn Dean and uh, Jorge Casal uh, will be shifted to next week um, and then we will conclude this first season. So do not forget to get your seats for next week as well, so same time, same place. Um, and first up today is uh, Jerzy Friemel. And uh, Jerzy did his PhD in, in Cologne at the Max Planck Institute. Um, afterwards, he did a very short postdoc um, with Gerd Jürgens in, in Tübingen, where he um, also became an independent group leader in 2002. And I had the great pleasure to work with him during this time. Um, and that also allowed me to uh, see his career uh, basically launching like a, like a rocket. He was a full professor in, in Göttingen and Ghent and uh, worked since 2013 at the Institute of Science and Technology in, in Austria. Um, and Yeji is, is actually a biochemist, um, but he was at the forefront when plant cell biology in combination with uh, plant developmental genetics uh, was coming of age. And he truly pushed this field forward and his outstanding uh, research uh, keeps on adding molecular me mechanisms to many long-standing questions and mainly in the field of, of auxin biology. Some people call him the Lord of the Pins. Um, and I'm sure you will hear about this protein also today. Uh, he got numerous well-deserved distinctions and prizes, including, for example, the Kerber, Kerber Prize, but I will not get uh, into this business. Um, ever since uh, his research team is, is uh, enormously productive and uh, due to the fact that his work um, is important for multiple aspects of um, and, and a lot of uh, different research fields, I think he's nowadays probably one of the most read and, and certainly um, the most cited plant scientists. And um, besides all this, um, I don't know whether you can see this. <laughs> It's actually, it's his birthday today, so a very special seminar um, today of him. And um, usually in real life I would sing, but I'm afraid this will uh, yeah, chase away your fun. audience here. So I, I will just leave it with this. It's a, um, well, kind of virtual cake. I, I will eat it on, on your behalf later. Um, and with this, Yeji, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Jürgen. I'm almost touched in my cold heart. It was a pleasure and privilege to have you in the lab. It was a great time and we, we had a lot of fun. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. And uh, as Jürgen indicated, I will be talking about auxin and, and pins. So I will try then to 
share my screen. It's my first online event ever. It so I it's weird to speak to the to the empty screen, but on the other hand, it allows me to to give my talk in house shoes, which is which is really fun. Um, so I hope you can see the screen. So that's the place when I'm currently working. It's a Institute of Science and Technology Austria, close to Vienna. It's in the middle of Vienna woods. And um, basically, normally I would say the place is not so great to be from the social point of view, but during the global pandemics, it's a perfect, perfect place to be. And um, also, it was 10 years ago, it was still a mental institution. So at some point 10 years ago, they they moved out the tenants and put in the scientists. So the local people say for them didn't change much. We are just more than they more present than than the previous uh, inhabitants were. No, but uh, but it's a great place. It's an interdisciplinary young institute. Um, according to all these different rankings, one of the most productive institutes in the world, and and I'm enjoying it very much to be there. So I'm heading one of the two plant groups that are at the institute. So it's a developmental and cell biology of plants. And I, um, as Jürgen indicated, I'm originally a chemist, but then I did a lot of molecular genetics, developmental biology and, and cell biology. The main plant we are working on is still the model plant Arabidopsis and the main molecule is auxin. And uh, when we talk about auxin, the Think that um, basically day after I first time in my life saw Arabidopsis, I also started to work on the auxin transport. So that's the directional movement of auxins through plant tissues. And auxin is actually the only plant hormones we have a good evidence that it undergoes this directional transport. So in the given tissue and in the given time, you have unidirectional movement from cell to cell. And this movement um, happens by auxin, you know, getting into the cell, partly by diffusion, partly by the influx carriers that are carrying auxin inside. Then something happens inside the cell, we really don't know much what. And then um, at some point the auxin moves the cell out by the action of the exporters or efflux carriers. And given that uh, auxin is deprotonated inside a cell actually they really needed the carriers to cross the, the lipid membrane and then auxin is outside of the cell we have absolutely no clue what happens in the apoplast and then it goes into next cell and so on and so on and like that you will get a movement through the tissue and that sounds like a quite an inefficient way to move a molecule through the tissue because you have to cross all these different membranes but it has one advantage because it allows that each cell actually can contribute to the decision how much auxin is flowing to the neighboring cells and in which direction. So basically by controlling the amount of the exporters and controlling on which side of the cell you put the exporter, that allows each cell to kind of contribute to the decision and then it allows the cell to coordinate their behavior within the tissue and then together maybe make a make a uniform flow of this signaling molecule so in terms of uh, molecular components when i started my phd um, late 90s then around that time four different groups at three different continents identify the gene family which we now call pins that are actually coding for these uh, exporters for these key components of the auxin flow and a very very exciting observation at that time was that the pin proteins are localized asymmetrically in the cell so if this is a longitudinal section of the stem and here in yellow you have labeled a pin one protein then that means that in this cell that I'm just indicating, the pin one is mainly on one side. And that would mean that the predominant flow of auxin would be um, 
downwards here or rootwards. So that was the very important uh, prediction of the hypothesis of Fox in transport that the polarity of the components for the transporting auxin across the membrane will actually determine the directionality of the flow across the tissue. And so this was the protein that, that nicely fulfilled this prediction. So then when I started my um, um, own lab, we one of the first things we did was actually try to show whether pin proteins are really able to transport auxin. There was a lot of discussion and controversy at that time because the direct evidence for this was missing. And so in my good friend and colleague in Praha, Jan Petrášek, we ex expressed the pin proteins inducibly in the tobacco cultured cells and could show that the more we express the pins, the more auxin the cells will export. And then our other colleagues and collaborators, Angus Murphy and uh, Marcus Geisler, expressed the pins in the mammalian cells in the east and in the east and in all these evolutionary quite distant uh, systems we were able to show that the pins when they are there they are mediating the flow of auxin out of the cells and then um, you know many years later the the wonderful work of, of Uli Hames who is now in Munich showed in in uh, all sites Xenopus all sites again that pins are able to transport auxin once they are activated by the kinases. So that all kind of settled the issue, I think, that whether the pins are, are able to transport or not. The major missing information we have on the whole system at the moment is the structure. So I put here something before, but this is really just a optimistic prediction based on the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic regions in the protein, how, how such a transporter would look like, but in fact we don't have any idea. And so that would be amazing if, if somebody would, would manage to get a structural insight into this machinery. This is certainly missing. So the other issue that we quite uh, tried to solve, and that was Justina, my very first postdoc when I was working, we were supervising each other. It was great fun. So she tried to figure out whether indeed the polar localization of the pin proteins will be determining the directionality of auxin flow. And at that time, that was really a very important and very open question, whether if you would change the polarity of the pin, that would, that would change the directionality of auxin flow. And um, she, she made quite an ingenious manipulation of the sequences of the pin proteins and, and managed to put the same pin protein in one instance at the lower side of the cells. In this case, it's the epidermis of the root. And here, the same pin, pin protein at the upper side of the cell. And then by indirectly monitoring auxin flow within the root, she could show that it really matters. So if the if the pin protein is on the on the lower side, so towards the tip, there will be no auxin flow, so you don't see the auxin reporter GFP signal here at the lower lower side of the root. But when you put it on the right side of the cell, that's sufficient to to mediate the flow um, in these cells. So that was that was really really important because you can then imagine then whatever signals, whatever conditions will then change the polarity or localization of the pins in the cells, that would lead to the redirection of the signaling molecules, so meaning auxin uh, within, the, within the plant tissues. And like that, you can modulate plant development in response to, to different signals. So one of the examples is, and here you see, Jürgen again when he was uh, younger and happier. No, I'm kidding, just younger. So when he was in my lab, he contributed to this to this amazing finding that basically when you gravity stimulate the root, then the gravity perception will lead to the change of pin localization and that will redirect auxin fluxes. So that was really important. So here you see columella cells that's within the root tip they will be, when the root is growing down normally, 
there, there is a quite apolar distribution. But once you put the root tip or the root in this horizontal position, then the pin sphere relocates by so far unknown mechanism to the lower side of the cell, and that will lead to the redirecting of oxygen flow. So therefore, that is one of the examples when, when a signal from outside by changing the polarity of these transporters basically leads to the changes of ox influxes within the organs and then that will then lead to the change of plan development. So that was sometimes um, in the 2000s, mid of 2000s, all these things were kind of we, we were understanding that, that we have multiple pins and they are expressed in all the different parts of plants. So like here pin four in the root meristem or in the embryo. Then there was pin one in the shoot apical meristem, pin three in the endodermis and so on. And that these activity of these pin proteins that are making this transportation network in the different contexts is then leading to this asymmetric distribution of auxin and that is then um, basically mediating the different developmental processes. So that was that was kind of a model that that is now very well accepted and, and many many groups are working on that that was crystallizing like like 10 15 years ago. And today I would like to give you one example. So one developmental process we are working on where, where also auxin transport and auxin distribution and auxin signaling are important and this is the gravitropism. So many people in my lab are interested how this happens. So one of the really big question is still how is it that the shoots are growing up and the roots are growing down? in response to the same signal using uh, using the same endogenous hormone auxin as a as a coordinative substance so so how how that is done and um, so i will i will give you some some insights what what we are doing in in this topic um so one message that was quite surprising for us and and we figured out uh, recently relatively recently and that was Yujo, a wonderful postdoc in my lab so he was interested how the root gravitropism or gravitropism in general evolved during uh, race of uh, land plants and during the colonization of land by plants and uh, he did an experiment which was very very simple looking at a different different uh, evolutionary um, different species and look at the gravitropisms we thought somebody must have done that in the last hundred of years but doesn't seem so because what he found was something unexpected so if you look at the lower plants at the evolutionary more primitive species like mosses or lycophytes or ferns and if you look at the root gravitropism there is a gravitropism but it's a very slow inefficient bending so like here in ferns 36 hours after gravity stimulation you have you have relatively modest bending on the other hand once you look at the species of the seed plants so from the gymnosperms uh, to the more recent plants then all of the sudden the gravitropism becomes much more efficient so you see the bending bending kinetics in comparison is really much much faster and so Yujo was trying to figure out what happened at the transition between between ferns or non-seed plants to the seed plants and um, then uh, there is a it's a very complicated slide and i i don't want to explain everything you can you can read it we we were lucky to publish it last year but basically what he showed that when the seed plant started that was the time when the gravity perception in the root got restricted to the root tip so ferns for example can have a gravity perception also in the in the other parts of the root but with the seed plants there came this restriction to the root tip and they came the new pin dependent auxin transport that was going from the root tip 
away from the tip towards the elongation zone where the control of growth occurs. And then he could really find out which changes during the evolution of the pin proteins in the sequence of the pin proteins happen to enable this new function auxin flow from the tip upwards, which we couldn't find anything like that before uh, before in uh, in the lower plants. So if you are interested in that, please have a look at the, at the paper. Yujo made a very wonderful job of figuring that out. So, okay, so since seed plants, we have this um, very rapid, uh, rapid uh, response. And in order to study it, we needed to build kind of machines in order to be able to to gravity stimulate the roots that would be growing normally vertically under the microscope and within seconds immediately look inside the cells and inside the tissue what is happening. So we built up this vertical microscope. That's the nice thing if you are in the interdisciplinary institute. So you have a wonderful engineers like, like Robert. So that was the guy who basically helped us to build the microscope from the technical point of view and Daniel and Matthias. Um, two postdocs in my lab were contributing to that. So, and it's working really wonderfully. And we made a tracking uh, program. So you, here you see the time. So 17 hours tracking this root tip. So it's growing and the microscope is automatically following the tip. So you put your samples in and you go to the pub and then you come back in the morning and you figure out you forgot something to switch and you have to do it again or, you know, things like that. But no, it's really, it really changed our, our way. What are we able to do when we are studying um, root development? So this was, this was really, really major thing that happened. And then Mates coupled with that microscope also the microfluidics device. So basically you have these, these channels or chambers where you can grow the individual plants and then you can, you can regulate what kind of medium, what kind of the signal you are giving into the each, uh, each channels. And then like that, again, immediately you can follow under the microscope what's happening. So you, you just can put it, put it directly on the vertical microscope and then, then you, can, you can control the environment very, very well. So that's how it looks in real. Basically, the Arabidopsis seedlings are growing in the channels and the microscope is ready and there are tubes which which can individually treat with different things. And then you can follow under the microscope. So when one of the things he was looking at is, if you have the fast response of roots to gravity, uh, Mathes was asking a question, so how fast is then the response of root growth to auxin? And so he put, he put uh, Arabidopsis root, this is an auxin, uh, auxin marker, but it's not important now. What is important, whenever you see the, the pink, that's when he flushed with auxin. And then he removed again, and then he put the auxin, and then he removed again. And then you see the, when, the, when the root was growing, it was really immediately, here you have it as a growth curve. So immediately when you put auxin, the growth inhibition starts. And when you remove the auxin, the growth resumes. And that you can really do for quite a long time. So there is a reversible rapid, uh, rapid response of root growth to auxin. And when he looked at the speed of the reaction, because now he exactly could measure when the auxin hit the surface of the root and then measure immediately how, how fast the root is growing, he figured out that conservatively, the root must be reacting in the time frame shorter than than one minute. So, and that was that was very surprising because all the auxin signaling mutants that were actually identified based on their inability to inhibit root growth by auxin were were linked to the nuclear pathway that is regulating transcription of genes. So, so Mathes he has now his own lab in Praha. And, and working again on this topic, continuing to work on this topic. So he basically figured out that the, that the 
canonical auxin signaling mechanism, the tier one AFB uh, receptor based signaling must have also a non transcriptional output. And so it will be exciting to see how, how that works. Okay, so if we put it together for the for the simple scheme, what is happening? So we have a root that is gravity stimulated. We have the perception of the gravity which is happening in these cells in the root tip. And as I mentioned, there is this uh, relocation of the pin three, which follows the sedimentation of the gravity perceiving heavy starch filled stutelids, amyloplasts. So pin three somehow follows this, uh, this direction of gravity and gets localized at the lower side of the root. That will redirect the auxin flow that comes from the up towards the lower side of the, of the root. Then pin two, one of these pin auxin transporter will take over and will pump the auxin to the elongation zone. Here in the elongation zone, there is this rapid non-transcriptional reaction of the elongation of the cells to two auxin. So there is a rapid inhibition and then the difference in the growth between the upper side and the lower side here will make the bending that you see. But there is one more thing which is quite mysterious for us since quite a long time. And this is that on the way from the tip to the elongation zone, the auxin gets, the auxin flow gets reinforced. So the pin two that is pumping auxin through these cells gets actually destabilized at the upper side of the root and gets stabilized at the lower side of the, of the root. And that was observed for the first time in, in Christian Lushnik lab by, by Lindy Abbas. And this basically made sense because you need the flow only along the lower side of the root, but we never understood what is the, what is the mechanism, how, how it happens that the pin to here knows, okay, I should get stabilized, and the pin to here gets this destabilized. So, so what kind of, the, of signal is, is making that? So of course, the easiest thing was to imagine that auxin itself would basically stabilize its own transport, will have a positive, positive feedback on its own transport and reinforce this flow. And so that's what I will be talking during the rest of my talk. And the hero of this project is Lesia. She is a postdoc um, in uh, in our lab since a couple of years, and she took a, basically a project of TMK leucin rich repeat receptor like kinases. And I'm eternally grateful that she took this project because the project when she came had a really bad reputation. It was due to the possible association of this family of these proteins with, with ABP1, auxin binding protein 1, as a potential perception input of auxin. And for those that are in the auxin field, you know that a couple of years ago the ABP1 field got uh, uh, suffered a couple of heavy hits. And in this time, Alessia was brave enough to say, OK, let's, let's have a look at this this family of the receptor-like kinases that are possibly associated with, with cell surface auxin signaling. So there are four family members. It's at the plasma membrane. And if you make the multiple mutants, you get quite strong developmental phenotypes. So they are, they are important for something. And as I said, originally they were associated with auxin signaling. And so Lesia started to look closely at the expression, at the localization, at the activity, at different phenotypes in the mutants. And one of the one of the things that she noticed was that the TMK mutants, already the single mutants, they bend much less. So if you gravity stimulate root, the bending is uh, much much less pronounced than in the wild type. And so if the green um, Curve here is the bending of the of the wild type. Then uh, TMK TMK1 mutant would be the the red. So that would be that would be much less bending after after all this time. And the TMK1 is the one that is that has the highest expression in the root. And then there are two more expressed. 
The root growth itself is, is quite the same in the mutants, but the gravit gravitropic response is clearly inhibited. So then Lesia had a look whether the kinase activity of the of the TMK1 is important. So she made a couple of constructs with mutation. She deleted the kinase domain. So so just just back again. So this is how the proteins look like: plasma membrane, extracellular domain that should perceive the signal, and then the kinase domain at the cytosolic side. And so she made the mutations here to to kill the activity of the of the kinase, and then. It was clear that uh, without without the kinase activity, the the TMK1 couldn't couldn't make its its function in the gravitropis. So TMKs are needed and the kinase activity as well. And then she had a look um, what happens with the TMK when you when you gravistimulate. And then uh, she observed this this spectacular kind of effect. So during the gravistimulation she could see that more and more TMK1 got expressed at the lower side of the root in comparison to the upper side of the root. So there was an asymmetry during the, the gravity stimulation when, when TMK got high at the lower side and, and weaker at the upper side. And then uh, Lesia is a fantastic biochemist, so she likes to do all these Western blots and co-IPs and cooldowns and Postex and, and all these things that uh, most of the other people that are sitting at the vertical microscopes uh, cannot do. And so she could show that these dynamics in the TMK1 you could observe also when you do a Western blot analysis after you know one, two, three hours of, of, of gravity stimulation. And this is not transcriptional because you could see the same dynamics or a bit delayed by in principle the same dynamics also when you when you look at the at the TMK that is expressed constitutively under the under the constitutive promoter. So we have this asymmetry in the TMK during the gravity response. And so then she looked uh, whether because this asymmetry actually, so she saw more TMK at the same in the same cells where we see more PIN2, where this PIN2 auxin transporter is stabilized. And these are the same cells where the auxin is flowing during the gravity stimulation. So that's the DR5 undirect uh, res, uh, reporter for auxin that, that shows that there was a elevated auxin levels in these cells. So she just looked whether TMK is involved in generating these asymmetries in PIN2 and auxin. And the answer was yes. So here you have a quantification. So this is the PIN2 at the, at the lower side, much stronger PIN2 at the upper side. If you look in the TMK1 mutant, the asymmetry is basically not there over time, which is developing in the wild type. And the auxin flow. The auxin asymmetry is still there, but it's much weaker. It's what we would say, it's not reinforced. It's, uh, it's weaker and that corresponds then to the much slower and less efficient bending in the TMK mutants. So basically, again, confirmed uh, the, the PIN2 dynamics confirmed by the Western blot and in the TMK1 mutants looking different. From the from the wild type, so that's all fits. It's not only our microscopic uh, dreams, but but you when you look at the at the protein in the roots, you see it as well. So so basically, we have this situation that TMK gets high in these cells, and it's required there to have pin too high there, and uh, reinforce the auxin auxin flow or auxin asymmetry here and there. So. How it's done was the next question. And so, of course, as, as I said at the beginning, if we were thinking how auxin flow along the lower side can get reinforced, we and other people were speculating along the same line, saying it could be auxin itself that is basically promoting its own flow. So the idea would be if auxin would be managing to stabilize the TMK here and activate maybe the TMK here. That might be the, 
the input how how the auxin is um, translated the auxin input is translated into the pin 2 activity or stability so we looked what happens if you treat the TMK GFP roots with auxin and that was quite shocking so 5 nanomolar IAA so quite low concentration of auxin and we got this massive upregulation of the TMK in the roots so really I mean I don't know how many fold uh, more signal you get if you if you treat with a low concentration of auxin and so that would really explain how this this uh, maximum of TMK abundance is uh, is happening at the lower side and again uh, you could see it it's not transcriptional because on the constitutive one uh, on constitutive expressing you could see it at the western blot as well and I mean that works also for the constitutive uh, GFP lines here so auxin somehow increases Sorry, the abundance Sorry to interrupt you, but just uh, you know you get a birthday bonus but um... Watch, watch the time a bit, okay? Thank Thanks. you, Jürgen. Okay, so, okay, we get the activation and promotion of the, of the TMK abundance. And then the question was how that could uh, regulate the, you know, increasing the pin, pin stability, increasing the, the flow by, by the pin proteins. And so we looked whether the TMK is able to interact with PIN2. And here you see a Fred Flim experiment. So this is a method where the lifetime of the, of the fluorophore decreases when an interacting protein is bringing acceptor there. So if this is the lifetime of the, of the TMK1 GFP alone, and then when you co-express PIN2 and Cherry, and when the lifetime goes down that means that there is an interaction and this is a very robust method that you can really nicely quantitatively do it and we could show that with with many different controls that this is a this is again an interaction that requires a, a, a kinase domain of the tmk and so there is a there is a direct interaction between between pin 2 and tmk or at least very close association and then let's see how the, this co-IP experiment when she biochemically verified the interaction. So this is a very convincing co-IP showing that these two proteins are interacting in auxin-dependent manner because this is without auxin and this is with auxin. And then, okay, if we have a kinase interacting with the a, with a auxin transporter, the next thing was to look whether the kinase is able to phosphorylate the the pin to so we took the hydrophilic loop this is the middle part of pin and then a radioactive in vitro assay showed that basically the tmk is able to phosphorylate phosphorylate pin 2 and i'm almost done this is a summary so the idea now is that we believe that we um, identified the way the mechanism by which auxin can reinforce its own flow by activating and increasing the abundance of the cell surface auxin signaling component, the TMK proteins. Auxin promotes the interaction of these proteins with the auxin transporters. And then they both together are they stabilized at the plasma membrane. In addition, the kinase phosphorylates pin, uh, pin protein. We don't know whether this phosphorylation is then important for the stabilization at the plasma membrane, but, but that's what is happening, that these both proteins then reinforce this auxin flow along the lower side of the root. So that is our current unpublished story on how auxin can regulate the basically the throughput of its own flow through cells. And I would like to acknowledge the collaborators, Tong Da Shu from China and Yvonne Jale from France, who are working on that with us. And then thank you to the groups. So these are the old plant researchers at ISD Austria, so two plant groups that are there. And I think at the, at the time of the summer solstice, that's a good, good uh, picture for, uh, for the winter holiday type of thing. So thank you very much and I'm done.
And if somebody by chance would like to be brave enough and come and join us, please do. I'm looking, or we are looking in the hall for the PhD students and postdocs. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful, Yuji. Very nice talk. Uh, very interesting new data on TMK1. Um, there are a couple of pressing questions apparently about uh, TMK1 now because uh, Andre Kuhn, Andreas Niebel and Kwan Ju Lu, they're wondering about um, how now TMK1 is, is activated by auxin. So, and whether auxin um, basically binds to TMK1 and whether this binding um, can trigger the interaction with PIN2. Sure, that's the, that's the major open question in the field. So, how, how auxin activates TMK? Um, Inge, that's a postdoc in my lab, she made very extensive uh, study whether, whether auxin can bind TMK and activate TMK directly. We didn't get any, any positive results, so the only thing I can say that it looks quite convincingly that TMK cannot do it by itself, so there must be a, still an intermediate protein that, that does it. For ABP1, um, I still I still think that's a possibility because we have a we have a lot of uh, lot of parallels in the phenotypes between the different TMK mutants and the original knockdown ABP1 lines. But um, the only explanation at the moment for me it would be that uh, ABP1 must be functionally redundant because the knockout mutant itself doesn't have these phenotypes that we see in the TMKs. So we don't know, and ABP1 is still a possibility, I would say. Uh, so another question is is now how specific is this interaction with PIN2? And Deksha Singh uh, wonders about the evolutionary context of it, as, as you also showed that there is this uh, PIN2 dependent um, evolution or specific evolution of, of gravitropism there. Um, it's not specific to PIN2. So, so we have a we have an interaction also with pin one at least, and there that would be in other developmental context most likely because pin one has nothing to do with gravitropism. But there are many instances where where auxin positive auxin feedback on its own flow is important. So we are at the moment exploring these these other other possible phenotypes. So it's not specific for pin two. From the evolutionary point of view, the simple question, uh, answer is we, we really don't know. We, we didn't check yet. Um, so with PIN2, it's, it's easy because PIN2 is really specific to seed plants. So if we would look in the lower plants, there is no PIN2. And therefore, we, we cannot test whether this interaction would be happening also in lower plants. For the PIN1 uh, functional ortholog, we don't know yet. So we, we, I think we first have to figure out what is the role of the TMK pin one interaction and then see whether these processes or analogical processes are happening in the development of lower plants and then, then have a look. So we don't know, we don't know much. Due to the time, um, last question of, of Krzysztof Wapnik, and he wonders whether the mechanism that you are describing is somehow also um, linked to the auxin -mediate, mediated cleavage of TMKs, um, and, and and maybe mixing mixing this this question with with the timing. So I guess this interaction with PIN2 and the stabilization is is rather a, a slow process, right? And uh, the gravity is, is is rather a fast response, so so probably there are several things happening at the at the same time. So how 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 do you see this mechanistically? Well, from the timing point of view, of course that's a that's immediate, right? You add auxin or you increase cellular auxin levels, and then you start to increase the interaction between the pin and the TMK. I mean, there is no delay. There is it, it's a it's a direct interaction. So when you can imagine when the first asymmetry of auxin in, in the tip happens, then it immediately starts to get propagated. Mm -hmm. the, and and then, then how fast the phosphorylation of the pins leads to the stabilization at the plasma membrane, that we don't know yet. We need to get the phosphomimic and phosphodep uh, versions of the, of the pin too and look at it. But as you know by yourself, the, the constitutive cycling of the PIN2 is, is, quite, is quite fast. So basically, if the phosphorylated version would, would be no longer 
endocytosed, for example, then the accumulation of the protein at the at the cell surface would be happening very fast. So so timing is not my concern, I would say, mechanistically. And what was what was the other part of the question? Sorry. The cleavage uh, of the TMK that has been just published. Uh, there, there, I don't know. I mean, we we don't. There, just just for the people. So there was a very beautiful paper a year ago or, or two years ago from Tongda Shu showing that the um, auxin can lead to the cleavage of the TMK and then the cleaved part will go to the nucleus and regulate transcription. We have no indication that that this would be an overlapping mechanism. I, I, I think that the TMK on one hand can get cleaved and transcriptionally regulate the genes and on the other hand it can directly interact with different substrates including PIN2, phosphorylate them and directly change their activity. I don't think these are, these are connected mechanisms. We don't, we don't have any, any data indicating this. Great, Yuri. Thanks a lot once again, um, spending your time with us during your birthday. So uh, regards to, to Eva and the rest of the family uh, and say sorry that- Thank you very much. We will we be celebrating happily. Thanks, thank you, Jürgen. Thanks thank everybody you. for watching. All right, and uh, next up is uh, uh, Nicola Patron. And um, now we are getting into uh, synthetic biology with her. Nicola uh, did her po uh, postdoctoral research at uh, John Innes Center and University of British Columbia. And um, she founded her group in 2009, actually in Melbourne, uh, Australia. And she returned to Europe in 2013, establishing herself in, in Norwich, first at the Sainsbury and uh, subsequently at the Earlham Institute. Uh, she was recognized by SynBioLeap um, in 2015 as an emerging leader in synthetic biology. I mean, how, how cool is this? And uh, we're very happy to, to have her today um, to share her inspiring visions with us and asking, can biology, uh, can biological complexity uh, be reversed engineered? Uh, Nicola, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to your talk and um, please, the virtual stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, can, can, you, can you hear me okay? I hear you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jürgen, and to Mary and to everyone else that's been involved in organizing these seminars. I, I think they've been a really beautiful thing to have had as for the plant science community through this very unusual period. Um, so today I want to introduce the work that we do in my lab. I particularly want to talk about the approaches that we take to engineering and then focus on a, a project that's become very central to us and for which the outputs are being used in several other biotechnology projects. And the concept I want to get across is that by rebuilding and reconstructing, we're able to progress both complex design goals and also gain novel insights into complex biological processes. So, why are my slides not moving forward? Okay, so uh, we're synthetic biologists and for those of you that are not familiar with the term, synthetic biology is the intersection of uh, engineering, biology and modeling. So broadly, it's, it systematically applies formal approaches and employs computational power to make complex bio biotechnology goals tractable. So it also employs then um, uh, uh, principles of engineering. So these include, for example, the use of standards exemplified here by standardized DNA parts to simplify the process of building um, more complex designed and synthetic networks. It also then includes um, abstraction, uh, for example, from the underlying DNA uh, level code to enable the rapid design and construction of numerous and increasingly complex biological functions, somewhat analogous to the use of uh, uh, the way that software engineers use um, natural language based programming languages rather than programming in binary machine code, which would obviously be extremely challenging. So for us, then, the combination of standards and particularly abstraction allows us to be able to automate workflows and scale them up in terms of number of reactions and scale them down in terms of um, 
uh, volume. So, for example, what, uh, I have two roles in my in my institute, one of which is to run my research group and the other of which is to direct the biofoundry, which is a research facility. And in the biofoundry, we can automate down to sub microliter reactions. We generally work in 384 well plates. We run rapid prototyping in for plants in protoplasts or in cell free systems. Um, and I totally understand. I also come from a biology background for biologists. You kind of think of these as some kind of technology that supports you uh, and maybe just their better platform facilities for you. But the engineering side as me, as a synthetic biologist, the upscaling of that biotechnology pro process is an essential advance to enable uh, innovation ecosystems that are similar those to exist for technologies that we seek to disrupt. So for chemical engineering, for uh, electronic engineering, those kind of things we're putting in place the platforms that will allow industries to grow or a buyer economy to grow in the same way. And then finally, I guess, then the principle of uh, engineering that's most famous is the co iterative progression through these design, build, test, learn cycles, which is how our work progresses. So in plants, uh, we all know that there's many uses of plant biotechnology. We all love them. We'd all love to see some of the uh, fundamental science that we're doing applied in some of those. And these include you know, agriculture, uh, consumer traits, um, uh, biofuels, and biomanufacturing for health and industry, for example. In our lab, uh, we have projects that aim at products in a number of this different, different categories. I'm just going to focus on a few of these today. So first of all, we have quite a lot of work in biomanufacturing. So in biomanufacturing in microbes, as you will probably be aware, is already really coming of age. So this can be exemplified by looking at this image here. So this is Amaris's facility in Brazil, and it bioproduces uh, sesquiterpene. It bioproduces the sesquiterpene uh, transbetaphanosine by yeast fermentation. And uh, if you look at it carefully, you can just about see that it is surrounded by plants and it's surrounded by fields of sugarcane to avoid transportation of that sugar feedstock. So plants here are just providing the sugar, which as a plant scientist, I don't think is very cool. Uh, and there's rightly been some criticism of increasing demand for agricultural land for the production of feedstocks. And this might be tackled in a number of ways by looking at using crop waste rather than refined sugars, and looking at alternate chassis that use different feed stocks and there are different microbial contenders but as plant scientists again we're interested in photosynthetic chassis including plants but uh, engineering any living organism is really difficult so even in really well uh, understood microbes like yeast and e coli is, it takes a huge amount of work to build optimize a heterologous pathway multiple iterative design build test line cycles um to uh push to you know optimize what your pathway will look like and then to push flux into that pathway or to uh prevent the diversion of pathway intermediates away and then that's all before the project moves probably out of an academic lab and into a production engineering lab where there's even greater time and expenditure um which is very different to a lot of the work that's been done in plant systems so far where you're mainly just express, over expressing the few genes so a lot of the work we do is kind of thinking well how do we get to the ability to even go through these kind of cycles in a photosynthetic chassis so in our lab uh so we have a couple of projects that are aiming at uh plant-based biomanufacturing so one of these is uh looking to uh, producing some medicinal compounds that are found in the asteraceae Another of those is looking at uh, producing um, sex pheromones, insect sex pheromones uh, that can be used as uh, species specific methods for pest control and agriculture. And these, were, these, uh, these projects have multiple different steps to them. They have uh, a discovery phase where we look for the genes involved in those biosynthetic pathway and people use different approaches. We tend to use genomics and we integrate then comparative metabolomics and transcriptomics to be able to identify genes and pick those. I don't have time to talk to you about that exciting pathway discovery today. Uh, and then, um, we would move then to rebuilding that pathway and then optimizing it for expression in a heterologous post, which really means controlling different things. And one of the things that one of the problems that we've come across in a couple of the projects is that controlling relative expression levels can be really important. And we do not have the regulatory elements that we need to build 
the kind of complex genetic circuitry that we need to do that. And finally, we move to expressing things in plants and the plant has its own idea. It reacts to the presence of fallen molecules. It derivatizes into intermediates. And again, we go back to kind of um, transcriptomics and genome editing to then start addressing uh, some of this uh, metabolic engineering. So in the lab, we have people that are biochemists that are working in uh, characterizing enzymes. We have people that are metabolic engineers. And then we have this new class of people that are really interested in, I guess, we're really hardcore molecular biologists, but uh, moving into modeling and engineering in a big in a big way. So today we're really going to focus on this engineering of regulation. Um, and it's also important to us for engineering agricultural traits, uh, so particularly traits that are controlled by um, complicated gene regulatory networks. So we know um, that uh, gene regulatory networks are often composed of many complex hierarchies and interlinked feedback and feedforward motifs of transcription factors and these enable dynamic responses they enable uh, a plant to have you know small expressions or large expressions to not overreact to small changes in the environment um but in the past most of what we've been able to do has really just been to be able to knock out nodes and as these are transcription factors and they're often interlinked in other networks this is really difficult from that type of experimentation to get fine insight into how a network functions so instead we're interested in modeling recoding and reconstructing regulatory networks to understand function so in microbes, uh, again, this work has kind of progressed from this past with the, like these small specialized parts and doing you know small numbers experiments into large larger sets of parameterized collections, and then kind of really moving, I think, even within these couple of years into being able to relate these sequence elements into network functions, rebuilding, doing these really large scale experimentation that allows you to apply things like machine learning to look at these quantitative differences in global gene expression going out. And we really like to be able to get to this stage. And this is being done uh, by lots of different um, engineering approaches, both by then engineering synthetic regulatory sequences, devices, and networks. So we kind of work across all of these. And I actually, it's not that this is a simpler thing to engineer. Regulatory sequence is just as complicated to engineer as a device or a network. And we're going to talk about this today. So our goals then are to really were the start these projects to understand and characterize the intrinsic and emergent properties of regulatory sequences and to be able to build synthetic sequences that would allow us to initiate expression from synthetic circuits either in response to endogenous or exogenous signals and also uh, for our biotechnology aims to regulate the relative expression of different genes and pathways okay so um so we started then thinking about what we needed most and we started thinking about then what are the no known features of constitutive promoters and we're particularly fascinated by these partly because it seems like everyone ignores them uh, and also because they have I think an amazing cap capability of driving expression in cells that have a lot of very a lot of very different things going on in those cells uh, and in addition for lots of engineering goals we really want to express things throughout the throughout the plant to take advantage of you know a biomass and we, what we really needed was a large suite of constitutive promoters of different strengths for various different projects. So we know from work in other lab, particularly the McGraw lab, that tissue specific and constitutive promoter general architectural features look a little different. We know the constitutive promoters are less likely to have tatter boxes. We know that their starts of transcription tend to be a little bit less specific. So there'll be a broadened a broader range of transcripts and it's not so easy to pin down what you think your transcription start site is compared to a tissue specific promoter and then when we started oh, i'm sorry i've cut off my gene names here when we started looking at um then the transcription factors that have potentially have the capability to bind to individual constitutively expressed genes what we find is that they are generally a very large number of transcription factors so the gray here is the presence of a binding site and we also find that individually those transcription factors are in themselves not constitutive they have very uh um different expression patterns and this is um uh 
supported by earlier work where people took subsections of constitutive promoters, including things like 35S, um, and showed that when you just use these subsections of these promoters, you no longer have a constitutive uh, expression level, but you start to have tissue-specific expression levels. So that's what we conclude then, is that the constitutive pattern is not likely because they're using the same regulatory agents in each type of cell, but more likely because they're able to utilize the broad range of proteins in different cell types, and this explains why you would also then have different types of transcription. So then we have a kind of basic architecture that we know that we're looking for, uh, aiming at in design. So the next thing we have to do is set up a system to be able to do our experimentation and design. So the first thing we want to do is make a collection of cis regulatory elements that we know bind, uh, that, sorry, that, um, that come from constitutively expressed uh, promoters. Um, uh, and then we build a random chassis, which we basically have a 19 base pairs at the beginning, and then another little gap, a variable region where we can put our cis regulatory elements and our transcription start site. We always keep everything else that we are testing exactly the same so that it's uh, um, more quantitative. And then we set up a testing system which is ratiometric, so we have a test and a calibrator and in each system we uh, basically we always deliver these and we always deliver these to a subset of all the cells that we're delivering to, so we have a standard and a calibrator, so our output is basically um, the ratio of the standard to the calibrator normalized by, uh, sorry, the test of the calibrator then normalized to the standard and that means that we're able to quantify that expression level and we get the same figures in every experiment for each type uh, so this helps us to get a quantitative measure so the first thing we started doing was then added synthetic uh, um, orthogonal binding sites for synthetic orthogonal transcription factors into our chassis just to determine just to check that we could get a good dynamic range of expression so we added binding sites for tails we band, added binding sites for uh, GAL4, 5C3 um, fusion. So these are synthetic, obviously, they're not responding to other things in the cell. This is the only protein that they can bind. Um, we have very low expression levels in their absence to support that. And also bioinformatically, we have um, almost uh, no uh, binding sites for anything else. So then we see we'll be able to get this range of expression. I should have put something on here to orientate you. I think, so I guess for those of you that know, I guess NOS usually comes out around 0.2 and 35 S usually comes out around what, 0.7 or 0.8 uh, generally. So this kind of gives you some idea of strength. And we were looking for things specifically, we wanted actually to be able to make a good range in this weak to medium, because it's really good for being able to express, uh, to drive the expression of synth uh, synthetic, or drive the expression of transcription factors, which is important when you're building synthetic gene regulatory networks. Okay, so the first thing we started do, doing then was taking combinations of cis regulatory elements from the library that we had collated and then adding them into our synthetic promoters. And the first thing that we noticed was that, uh, so all of these promoters that we're showing you, everything on this X axis has the same number of cis regulatory elements added to it. So they are either in basically copies of the same or they're in multiple copies. So all these ones are here that are in pinky peach. They're just multiple copies of the same things and where you have yellow, then you have uh, a combination of these three. And it's really important that then to note here that you really cannot get expression with homologous repeats and endogenous ones, but when you combine them together, we start to get pretty good expression levels or at least statistically significant ones. This is nothing like a real a, a real promoter. We're not saying that these are strong or these are the end. We're just trying to hear, just trying to establish uh, roles. Okay, so why do you, why why would why would this be the case? It could be because protein protein interactions are important. It could be because you need an enhancer. So we were kind of surprised then that this was the same over almost all of the different combinations that we tested. So we started to, to decided then to move on and then investigate these two particular hypotheses that it's either direct protein protein interactions or an enhanceosome complex, and we did two things. We started by adding flanking sequences of various lengths and various sequence identity that would control for local sequence context, and then we started reordering our regulatory, our, uh, our cis regulatory elements with relative positions to each other. So each of these is just then a batch of elements that are either 
either have additional flanking sequence or have been reordered. And as you can see between those groups, they don't change. There's no significant change in expression between any of the groups. Um, so we're kind of left with the final hypo hypothesis then uh, uh, for the way that transcription factors are able to initiate, um, which is uh, passive, collabor uh, passive cooperativity or collaborative binding. So I'll just hold that and come back to another important feature because these two connect together. So there's one exception to that, and uh, cis-regulatory elements that bind B zips did not require additional proteins, or they did, they work quite well with just three copies of themselves. But what was different about those, which we didn't observe for other cis-regulatory elements, although I'm not showing you that data here, is that their relative position within our minimal synthetic promoters, and bear in mind here, we're only talking about 50, 60, 100 bases max. But um, then it was really important here that they were proximal. So here we have proximal middle distance into different uh, random chassis and uh, their the relative from, uh, position to the start of transcription was really important, whereas it wasn't really important for any of the others. We could move them about, we could shuffle them. There is a maximum distance where things start to drop off. Our promoters are not long enough to allow looping of DNA and, and we never that was never a design goal because we really wanted to make small elements so that we could make large gene constructs. Um, so, uh, so these two these two things that we're talking about here is the bees that kind of behave as if they were being something like a pioneer. They're able to work on their own. They're able to bind to the DNA with, without any other proteins being present. And then we also have passive cooperativity, which is great. But both of these processes are actually um, hypothesized to be for the displacement of nucleosomes. And this is not something then we'd expect to see in our transient expression systems. We're not talking about integrated DNA here. So we're a little bit puzzled about this. And we started reading the literature and we uh, come, came across actually several studies that do show that even transiently expressed DNA, at least in mammalian cells, by various different methods, I'm not going to talk through exactly how this proves this, um, do bind, do uh, nucleosomes do assemble, not entirely normally, but substantially normally uh, trans on transiently delivered DNA, which is maybe not so surprising. Um, so we kind of took these, then this information that we had, and we started making a design script. So our design script basically then takes from our library, it takes a number of cis regulatory elements without replacement. Uh, and then it adds them into the various uh, into the variable regions of our minimal synthetic um, promoter chassis, and then we can then we developed a script to predict strength, which is basically based on assigning a score to each base in the minimal synthetic promoter, uh, and then that score is adjusted by the type of CRE and the bases that are covered by the uh, BZIP transcription factor binding sites are then also numerically each adjusted by the relative position. So you get a score for each base and then you sum the score and divide that by the total length and then we calibrate. So this is just obviously a, a random, well not random, but it just ends up being as a numerator and then we can you, uh, take um, Using the CREs that we'd already tested, we could convert our predicted scores to a numerator. Um, so we ran our script and we got around a thousand, and most of these were weak, which we realized afterwards is because we didn't have very many basic transcription factors, which was really important for getting high strength, and we sampled without replacement, so there was no way ever to get more than a couple anyway. Uh, I, I'm not saying that it could only be zip -B zips, it's just that this, these were the only things that had that property within our library that we were starting with. Um, um, and then so we sampled a, uh, a new, some of these from our library, we synthesized them, we put them through our testing and we got a pretty good uh, correlation between our predicted score and our actual score. So we did have some that uh, were off the line and almost all of those that were off the line, we found that new motifs have been formed at the junction that obviously bound something that was known to be a really strong activator or a repressor. So we chose not to go back and readjust the script for the presence of newly built site or to remove those newly built sites because we don't have all the information for Arabidopsis about what all the possible binding sites are and we were just reducing our design space far too much. Um, and 
so what we did then was we moved into testing those as stable plants. Uh, so here is just um, uh, three of those of different strengths. This is the one without any binding sites. Uh, we have broadly constitutive expression patterns. There are some differences in individual events, as you would expect from random integration, uh, but they basically retain their um, expression pattern that we uh, that we observed in um, transient assays. We then went and tested those across different species, and again, we keep our uh, they pave similarly as they did in Arabidopsis in two other species as well. So then we were able to move forward and move these into our, uh, uh, to start building with these. So here we're just showing a couple of really simple preliminary experiments where here we are basically using this to drive a synthetic transcription factor, which then uh, binds to one of those minimal synthetic promoters that I showed you right at the be beginning that just has only has binding sites for this. So here we can show that we can initiate expression. So we did this. So here I'm just showing it as equivalent to using 35S to initiate expression or using our, you know, 150 base pair minimal promoter to initiate expression. And then we were also able to show then that uh, by controlling the numbers of binding sites here, we can have an entirely synthetic circuit where we control the relative expression of one to the other. So we can either have equal amounts or we can have a quarter of one as we do as the other. So this was really important then going back to one of our biotechnology projects. So just very br briefly here, our project uh, in, in uh, manufacturing insect sex pheromones, and this is a, an amazing project with a large number of labs involved in the European collaboration. There's a huge amount of work and I'm just showing you like a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of it. So please um, do go and look at the suspire.info website if you want to hear more about the work going on in that project, which is led by Diego Orges. So uh, one of the goals in this project was to express this um, biosynthetic pathway but that produces uh, the sex pheromones of uh, moths. Um, and the pheromone of this particular the species uh, or the species in this group is controlled by the specific ratio of the molecules. So we wanted to be able to control the ratio of uh, the molecules and therefore how fast flux progresses through the pathway. Uh, so we needed to have different promoters that work in the same cells, ideally constitutive, but didn't have to be. Um, to be able to do this, so then we were able to uh, design different versions of. Uh, small synthetic circuits with different numbers of binding sites and then make you know different profiles of the amount of each gene that we're able to do. So just to summarize then, we are able to do ground up rational design of constitutive minimal synthetic promoters with predictable strength uh, with either orthogonal or endogenous control, I, by which I mean expand, uh, responding to either endogenous or orthogonal transcription factors. Um, we found rules by the way the which that constitutive promoters work by passive cooperativity and the relative position and the importance of the relative position of key uh, cis regulatory elements. And we were able to regulate the relative expression of genes in uh, synthetic regulatory pathways. So at the moment, then we are working on uh, engineering synthetic network motifs and rewiring and disrupting gene regulatory networks. We are also working on novel biosynthetic pathways from insects and plants and on plant chassis that are rationally engineered uh, for improved yield. I, sorry, that's a bit vague. I, don't, I mean, improved yield for biomanufacturing of the product that we want to make, not crop yield. Um, so hopefully that's some of the papers that you'll see coming out from us. So it just remains me, for me to thank the people that did all of the work. So particularly Yao Min Kai led this work. He's a very talented and uh, motivated postdoc, really excellent uh, molecular biologist that uh, has picked up a huge amount of modeling skills and bioinformatics skills, more or less independently. Also Kaliali Kalam is a postdoc that's been leading all the work in, uh, in the um, engineering sex pheromones, but really thank you to everybody else in the lab. Thank you to the staff in the biofoundry who uh, obviously progress a lot of our experimental pipelines and automate them for us. And thank you to all the lovely collaborators and not last our funding agencies for supporting us. And thank you all for listening. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Very nice. Uh, 
enormously impressive that that you got basically from this uh, synthetic idea um, and and then developing these synthetic uh, promoters that have this graded expression in in, in plants. I, I was just wondering, so there was like a, a quantitative difference between um, N. bentambiana compared to the other plants. Is this a, a technical thing, or are there really differences in in strengths considering yeah. the the different species? I don't know. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see it, particularly because we done all of our testing in Arabidopsis, but our original CIS regulatory library didn't come from there. So it didn't only come from Arabidopsis, it also came from the CIS regulatory elements that uh, are in, in plant pathogen promoters as well. So it could be that we took a couple of those key elements and they are just the, the, the DNA binding motifs are just more optimal in Mother Solanaceae. I guess we'll learn more once we start testing the Mother Solanaceae. I hope it's not just an experimental artifact of that being that, but our, our system really controls for um, delivery, so I'm not, I, I don't think that will be the case. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really know the answer, but that's how it appeared. Okay. Uh, Goodwin James is actually wondering about um, epigenetic regulation. Um, yes. Yep, it would be great. I guess uh, we're, we would love to be able to um, engineer genetic regulation to be able to see where uh, to be able to do that. So I, I guess in this study, we've limited ourselves to looking uh, to looking at the intrinsic properties of that DNA coding sequences. And then we know that there's lots of other things that are important. So we know that there'll be emergent properties depending on its genomic context and then new properties by epigenetic state. Um, and yeah, we would dearly love to have better tools for being able to do that. And yeah, and we're mm -hmm. kind of working on those as well. So Ray Collier um, basically appreciates uh, the the predictive, or, or basically asks whether there could be also a predictive model um, based on on your uh, synthetic work, and uh, whether you could actually look into the genomes and and predict how strong a genus is expressed. So we, I mean, yes, it could be scaled, but the parameters would change from how they are because we specifically, so our model is, and actually I probably hesitate it to a model, but the equation that we have is limited to that minimal length. Um, I and mean, our minimal length specifically does not allow distal interactions by looping, but that was because we, uh, we wanted, our design goal was to have minimal synthetic promoters. Mm -hmm. So it's, it becomes, quite a lot more complicated to look at longer sequences and figure those out and then you also obviously have to take into account chromatin state and chromatin accessibility i absolutely i don't i don't think it's beyond the possibility i do think it's not possible with our model we know that it doesn't work well for predicting longer or natural promoters but, but we understand why it doesn't um, we haven't tried to adjust it. Um, I, I, I do think it will be complicated. I think we would probably need help from uh, people that are much better at modeling than we are, but I do think that it is ultimately possible. But I think it probably requires, or undoubtedly requires machine learning and undoubtedly mm -hmm. requires a much bigger data set because of the increased complexity. But maybe one could also do the other way around, right? So looking into natural variation of, of transcription and checking then the, the sequences that, that, that you were using and checking whether there's a correlation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I guess for, to, a, to a point, lots of that data is there and it's available. I think, I think definitely it's kind of a project that's right to be done. Yeah. So Sebastian Schornack um, asks, are there major constraints on the orthogonal network in terms of plant-provided components? Um, I'm not sure I entirely understand that question. So the constraints on the... Um, so so I, the I don't know whether, whether it relates to the same what I was thinking, but, but at, at some point you were also showing, you know, like you, um, you, you add cis regulatory binding sites and at least for, for certain numbers you get like a linear increase but that probably doesn't stay like this forever, right? So you, you probably also are limited by the, by the plant components at some point. Uh, so where the promoter is orthogonal, it's, it only has, it's only, the only transcription factor that will bind to it is the one that you are providing to it and also co-expressing. Mm -hmm. um, 
so you're right at some point it probably will no longer be linear um, it's kind of difficult to say where that is because uh, at some point it's going to be product uh, it's going to also be a product of how far it is away from the start site and whether it can inter interact and whether it's just displacing other proteins as well um there'll be I, I, I guess another way of looking at that is um is can you just continue adding things and can you just keep continually start adding increasing transcription is there a you know is there an absolute level on what's the strongest promoter you could make and i don't i don't know the answer to that mm -hmm. uh, yeah at some point they will be limited by the components available and you know it's not completely orthogonal obviously it's a conceptually orthogonal it's still relying on the plants transcriptional the, the, machinery which will be limiting obviously at some point Sebastian is actually now chipping in some keywords, but I, I suggest that you just shift it to, um, to Twitter actually to continue um, discussing this. Um, Sebastian uh, Moreno is, is wondering uh, in what kind of organism you express these pheromones that you were mentioning. Uh, so our pheromones are being expressed in the Cotiana benthamiana. All right. Um, and uh, Dimitri Lapin. Um, uh, asked about the, um, the strength of regulatory elements in this MinSense predicting, this, uh, whether it uh, predicts uh, the strength of upstream sequences in the plant genes. Um, no, I think that's similar to before. I think it doesn't, it, it's not designed to predict longer sequences it doesn't take into account the ability of things to loop in this case because it only has a limited information on distal info on uh, distance um mm -hmm. uh yeah and we didn't take into account so we didn't look at integration sites when we in, we imported them to see how they in, where they imported we just wanted to know whether they were broadly constitutive or they weren't all right Thanks a lot, Nicola, for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, for the insights into, into your uh, ongoing projects. And as I said before, so if you want to continue discussing with Nicola, um, please uh, turn to, to Twitter. So she has a Twitter handle at Nicola Biologist um, and use the hashtag Plante Presents and other people can actually uh, join you guys. I think we, we saw two um, inspiring talks um, mechanistically linking to um, plant development and, and now to uh, biotechnological um, approaches um, and uh, as I said so we will have another one in the same time zone another seminar next week so and I hope um, to see you there same place same time and uh, with this I hand over to Mary to um, say farewell. Uh, thank you Nicolette, thank you Yuri and thank you Jurgen for once again a masterful handling of a, a lot of questions. We will download the questions and pass them on to the speakers uh, in case they'd like to pursue uh, answering some of them some more. Uh, as Jurgen mentioned, we have one more talk uh, in this series next week, um, July 1st, and we will take a little pause and then we'll resume in late August, early September. Please feel free to let any of us know if you would be interested in giving a talk. We actually have a web, uh, a web form that you can fill out with some information uh, on our Plante Presents page. Um, <laughs> you will receive a, an email, a follow-up email with a link to the recording as well as a survey that we'd love to have feedback as we plan season two of our series. So once again, thank you very much to the speakers, the moderator, and we hope to see you next week. Take care, everyone. Oh, and, and happy birthday, yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Ciao, guys. Ciao, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.